my name is David Goldberg. I'm the co-founder and global CEO of Founders Pledge. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about why we're so bad at doing good, which seems kind of crazy when you think about it. I'm going to start by painting a picture of the world. Every day, 21,000 people die of hunger. 65 million people are forcibly displaced at this very moment. And 836 million people suffer from neglected tropical diseases every single year. Not the sexy diseases that you can put pictures of in magazines, really ugly, bad diseases. And 1.5 billion people live in extreme poverty their entire lives. This is the world we live in. And with all these big numbers, why is there only one Elon Musk? Now, you can criticize Elon's policies, the way he does things, who he is as a person, but the guy is starting businesses to save the world. So, rather than just one Elon Musk, what if we had nine? Or even 81? Or 256? We need more entrepreneurs like Elon solving really tough problems. So I started with this hypothesis. Entrepreneurs solve problems. The world has problems, therefore entrepreneurs should solve the world's problems. Um, but it turns out, it's only really the best entrepreneurs that solve these big systemic problems, the Elons of the world. So, we need more Elons. Um, so how do you do that, right? All of you are entrepreneurs, but most of you are probably already growing a business. So it means you have pretty limited time to think about things other than what's in front of you, sort of existing for the next month or two or three. So, I bring out the handy Venn diagram. You have two things that you want to do, doing good on one hand and building your business on the other. So clearly what goes in the middle is doing good while building your business. Yes, um, but how? And this is, this is the, the sort of the, the crux of my talk. If you're building a business and you want to do good through it, I'm going to explore three potential ways, some reasonable assumptions, well, maybe reasonable assumptions, about how you might do that. So the first and the easiest, maybe, is we should start a CSR department. CSR is corporate social responsibility, right? So assumption one, CSR is the answer, praise be. Um, but it turns out that CSR, by nature of what it is, is usually an afterthought. Corporate social responsibility means you're trying to bake something into your business after it's already up and running. How do you do that meaningfully? It's always, always under-resourced, misunderstood, and generally unempowered within an organization. It doesn't really align with the reality mostly. You have employees that have tasks in front of, in front of them that require 110% of their time if you're growing fast and lean and hard. And giving away anything is really tough to do when you're young. And often you have unintended consequences. This is like you're trying to do good, but there's harm that comes as a result of it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna tell you a story. Does, does anyone know who this guy is? Yeah. Raise your hand if you know. Tom Shoes, Blake Mykoski. Tom's isn't the CEO of Tom's. Excuse me, Blake isn't the CEO of Tom's. He's the chief giving officer, right? So Tom's has built corporate social responsibility into their very model, right? The kinds of people that are doing it well. But it turns out the good intentions don't always lead to good outcomes. And Tom's is a pretty good example of that. I should back up. Tom's is a cool business. <laughs> they sell a lot of shoes, and they started in 2006 a one-for-one -one model. I sort of assumed that everyone knew what Tom's does. Um, so they sell shoes, and for every pair of shoes that they sell, they give a pair away to a child in the developing world. It's a beautiful story. Um, and in the 10 years or 12 years now that they've been running this, they've given away 50 million pairs of shoes in 70 countries. And last year, Bain Capital bought a controlling stake in Tom's, valuing the company at $625 million. So this is a business that's done really well and done social good. But as I said, good intentions don't always lead to good outcomes. So 10 years after they started in 2006, Tom's commissioned a social impact study to find out what they had actually accomplished by giving away shoes. And the results were sort of surprising. In the 50 million pairs of shoes that they've given away, there has been no overall effect on shoelessness or shoe ownershipness, or shoe ownership. There's been no effect on general health or foot health. And there's been no effect on self-esteem. The things that you would expect to happen as a result of giving people shoes didn't happen. So if that's the case, why are they giving away shoes? It turns out that when you give away things in a market that already has those things, shoes for example, you can destroy that local market. When you're dropping in hundreds of pairs of shoes and giving them to kids, the people who otherwise would be producing shoes there, 
can't produce them anymore because they're pushed out of the market. And it turns out that giving away shoes in this way created a, a sense of the Westerners should help us. And in a survey, 79% of children who were asked, should others provide for my family? They said, yes, others should provide for my family as a result of having given, been given shoes. That's crazy. And when you think about what the world looks like, 800 million people suffer from malnutrition, malnutrition, really extreme malnutrition, and you're giving away shoes, and those shoes don't do anything at all. You can't eat shoes. So, to Tom's credit and to Blake's credit, they, having got this assessment, decided to change their ways. Um, they changed their model and started to produce in local economies. 33% of their shoes that they give away are now produced locally. Um, they started selling sunglasses, and for every new pair of sunglasses, they'd give an eye surgery. They started selling bags, and for every new bag they'd sell, they'd help a woman train to, um, to help others give safe births. So, um, CSR department's out, from my perspective. So, what's next? And, and, and maybe you say, David, it's not out. We can still do it. We have really smart people on our team, and we can deploy those people to support local charities. So, we can help with our brains. We can just brain it. <laughs> but... Charities are complex. Um, and, and, and let's analogize a little bit. You think about your internship program, right? You have a group of young people that come in, they want to support your company, sometimes they get paid, sometimes they don't, but they're there to learn. And internship programs last a summer or a couple of weeks or a couple of months. But imagine if your internship program lasted three days. And it was three days played out over four months. So you had one day every four months. It would sort of be like this you'd have a bunch of people trying to understand what you do, and you'd be spending your time training them, which means that they don't actually do much. So when you're giving away your time to charities in really limited quantities, and three days is sort of the most I've seen companies give away, you have sort of mayhem. Um, so it takes time, and that's not even thinking about the legacy systems that most charities operate. It also turns out not to be the best use of your resources. Um, entrepreneurs and engineers and product designers and designers and all the people that work for startups make a lot of money. And it's not the best use of your time to give away something that's not going to be utilized well when you could just give money. Um, and it turns out Band-Aid solutions rarely help. Disruption, the thing that we cherish in this industry, can sometimes be counterproductive in industries that aren't ready for it. So I'll give you another example. Um, let's, let's make another analogy. The UK is a startup and it's part of an alliance of startups called the EU. And you have this guy, Nigel Farage, our, our best friend in the UK, who led Brexit, for those of you who don't know. This is the, this is the face of Brexit. He came in and he said, um, the UK startup doesn't work because we're part of this alliance that's dragging us down. Which is crazy, right? But he's really compelling and, uh, and told a bunch of um, older people that you know, this is a problem. We need to leave this alliance of startups. And so basically what he did is he walked into the UK's living room, he shat on the floor, and then he left. He said, you guys should clean this up. It's a real mess. <laughs> and, and what I'm trying to say with that is you shouldn't try to fix things that you don't understand when going in and trying to fix them can actually be really counterproductive for charities that already are like focused on on doing their jobs. So for you as entrepreneurs and you as business leaders, keep the main thing the main thing, unless you're really big. So there's, there's ex examples of, of companies that have done this really well and empower their employees, right? But they're really big companies like Salesforce and Patagonia and Google. They do it really well. So let's cross out, leverage our team to support local charities. And the third assumption, let's just donate to charity. Charity's good, right? Um, and what I want to explore is whether all charity is good or whether some charity is good. So I meet with hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs per year, all over the world. And there's three common questions that I get about charity. First is, are all problems equally important? And, and sort of in line with that, what are the, the worst problems? What are the, the most effective and the best solutions? And can you even trust the charities themselves? These implementing organizations, you hear about all the waste, how can you trust them? Well, um, it's not that all charity is good. It's that some charities are way, way better than others. And figuring that out is really tough. 
And that's sort of what I want to talk about now. So how do you give to the best charities? Again, an analogy. We're going to make the biggest difference, right? So let's say we're investing commercially. That you're, you, you've, you've made some money, you want to invest it. You have two funds, fund A and fund B. Um, fund A returns 4%, fund B returns 11%. This is compound, compounded annually over 10 years. By show of hands, who chooses fund A, all else equal? Great, not a hand is raised. Who chooses fund B, show of hands? Right. Everyone's hand should be raised because it's the better choice. The difference between them is fund A returns one and a half million and fund B returns about three million. That's double. It's a pretty significant difference. And when you're thinking about investing your money, the difference between four and 11% is the difference between a small pile of money and a really big pile of money, right? So all else equal, we want to make more than less as long as we're not hurting people, right? So let's apply that then to charity space. Let's say that you have a, a, a couple of different interventions that you can do. This is related to HIV AIDS. Um, one is you know, surgical treatment for a, a condition. The other is condom distribution, antiretroviral therapy, and then education for high-risk groups, right? Each of which produce different effects. When you're looking at this chart, and on the x-axis you have the, the level of the effect, the good that it does, you're going to pick the effect that's greatest. In this case, education for high-risk groups. Rather than treating HIV AIDS, let's just prevent people from getting it, right? Pretty obvious stuff. But why aren't we doing that more? Well, it turns out charity is rife with emotion and with um, catharsis. And you've experienced something and you should give to it because it's personal to you. But that doesn't always hold when you look at the data. So at Founders Pledge, we follow data. We're quantitative. Instead of following gut and intuition and stories and anecdotes and nice pictures, we follow data. So we're going to take a top-down approach and we're going to just sort of give it a set of framework criteria that we can just explore, that you can put to work when you leave here and say, if I want to give to charity, how am I going to do that in the best way? How am I going to do the most good? So we start with focus area at the top level. And we want to focus on things that are tractable. Tractable in the sense that, will it work? Is there a plausible solution for the thing? Um, and if there is, is it scalable? Is it important? Does it affect a large enough number of people? And finally, if it, if, it's, if it works and if it affects a really large number of people, is it neglected in the sense of, is it receiving money, enough money to support the entirety of that intervention? And are there enough people working on it? And so you think about malaria, which is a really big, big issue, and you have tons of people working on it. The scope of the malaria problem is so significant that it's still a neglected cause. There's not enough people working on it. So unless these three conditions are met, we shouldn't be giving to charities because they can do great good and they can affect a ton of people, but if they're not neglected, it doesn't really matter. Y your marginal impact, your marginal utility on that next dollar is very low. So let's dig down another level and let's look at the intervention. From an intervention level, we, we look at three things or we care about three things. We care about evidence. Have studies shown that the thing that we're doing works? Is there proof? And, and this is really important because charities talk a lot about what they create and they talk in outputs. And this is the second piece. We don't care about outputs. Outputs are proximate measures that don't tell us about the end state of the people that we're trying to affect. They tell us how many wells are drilled or how many pairs of shoes we've given away or how many uh, mosquito nets that we've distributed. They don't tell us about how the, the people have been affected by that. And that's the most important piece. We care about the outcomes. The level to which those people's lives have increased or the amount of suffering has decreased as a, as a direct result of that intervention. And then, of course, we care about cost effectiveness. And this is, sorry, you can put it like, for, for every $1,000, how many people are affected and by how much? Right? And so this gives us a sense of whether or not there's organizational bloat, whether or not overhead is, is crazy high given the outcomes that are being created. Now, I just want to sort of, as a little sidebar, overhead really doesn't matter when you think about charities. It doesn't matter because charities have staff, just like companies have staff, and those staff needs to be paid. And when you buy your iPhone, I bet a bunch of people here have iPhones, some of you have Androids, but when you buy your phone, you don't go to the sales clerk and say, how much does Tim Cook make though? Because that's what matters. No, what matters is your phone is great, and you're buying a product because it's the best. We should think about charity in the same way. And so then we dig down to the charity level and we say, does this organization have strengths? Are they good at doing what they're meant to do? Uh, does the management team have experience? 
Um, have you found that, um, that they've done other successful interventions before? Are they transparent, radically transparent? Will they share their results? Will they share their failures as much as they'll share their successes? That's a really important piece. If charities aren't failing, then they're not trying hard enough because there's failure in this sector. And that failure is a really good opportunity to learn and charities should be talking about it more when it happens and learning from it, just like startups do. And, and most importantly, again, sort of tied to this neglectedness issue is, is there room for funding? You can have all of these three areas accounted for and find a great charity that is strong and has transparency, but can't productively use that next dollar, pound or euro. What that means is it can't use your money. You shouldn't give to it. So you want to find the next most effective thing. So quickly, why is this the case? We, we know how to think about charity. Why are charities still not great? Why are so many of them bad at doing good? Well, the difference is, of the top five largest companies in the world by market capitalization, the oldest, Microsoft, was started in 1975. And of the top five largest charities by funding, the youngest was founded in 1910. That's crazy, like completely nuts. Why? Well, in the commercial sector, with businesses, you have products that the consumers actually buy and then use. There's a market-driven mechanism. And as a result, you've seen the phone change from a rotary phone, 1910, to an iPhone, a smartphone today. But with international aid, it's the same because the people who pay for the thing aren't the same people who use it. So there's no feedback loop. There's no mechanism for recipients of aid and stuff to say, this isn't what I need. This doesn't work. It's not helping. What donors get are pictures and brochures and impact studies that talk about outputs, not outcomes. They're intentionally opaque because being transparent means you're going to be found out that in, in 1910 we were sending food abroad and today we're still doing it. That's nuts. Why hasn't there been innovation in this sector? Well, I'm going to put it on the donors. I'm going to put it on the people who give away their money. Just like in the business sector, smart investors lead to better products. In the charity sector, smart donors lead to better charities. So we should be smart about how we deploy our money. And this is all well and good. Um, so we're going to say, I should donate to the very best charities. All well and good, awesome. But still, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm in the middle of this, this growth process. And I don't have money to give away. And the world still looks pretty bad. However, there's good news. And the good news is some of you are going to be really rich at some point, hopefully. Maybe 10%, maybe 20. But some of you are going to become very rich. And that's what we do at Founders Pledge. So what we're known for is getting people to make this statement. It's an if-then statement. If you make money selling your business, then you donate a small percentage of it to the social causes of your choice. But that's not really what we do. I mean, it is, right? It's the way that you become a part of our movement, our community, but what we do is we help people to give in a more effective way according to their context, whether that be giving as a business or giving as a founder. So I was told not to do a pitch, so I'm not going to. I'm going to just skip through this stuff. You should read it. We're really good at what we do. Um, and here are the kinds of people that are joining us in, the, in this journey. The founders of WeWork and Blockchain and Klarna and SoFi. And what are the other big European businesses? And Google DeepMind and Funding Circle and Y Combinator, and the early employees at Uber. It's a global movement now. And um, to just slightly correct my introducer, um, we've, we've raised uh, $545 million now. This is a couple of days old. Across 1,300 pledges in 30 countries. We've made 51 deployments. Our pledges have made 51 deployments, totaling $82 million. It's a movement that is doing stuff. And, and if we were just giving away money the same way that people always have, this $82 million would be meaningless. Truly, it wouldn't do much. But we're, we're taking this approach to charity that it can and should be better. So to come full circle, so what? Right? Giving to charity is easy. It really is. You can give right now. Before I finish my talk, I have a minute and 50 seconds left. You can take out your phone, you can Google best charity for X, find 150 results, 200 results, and click in a couple of, a couple of minutes to donate with PayPal or whatever payment solution that that charity uses. But you're not going to give well. You're not going to do the most good that you can because giving based on pictures means nothing.
We're here to help. Everything we do is free, and we're here to support entrepreneurs. We're here to support this room of people on their journey and thinking through how do you leverage your unique set of talents well. And this is what I want to close with. I started by talking about Elon Musk and the state of the world, and we only have one, and we should have many, many more. I want to see thousands. Charity is a journey, and Founders Pledge is a start of a journey. We don't just want to get people to give to charity. We want to start you thinking about what your role in the world will be post-exit, what you're going to do that changes things fundamentally, that fix, fixes our big, broken systems. In other words, be more Elon. Thank you for listening. I ask you one question. Sure. Thank you, David. Um, I'm just curious, do you have one charity that particularly inspires you? Yes. What is it? So um, if you're going to give this year, you should give to the charity Give Directly. I've talked about how these broken systems don't have feedback loops and how charity is intermediated by lots of different parties. Give Directly gives cash to the ultra poor directly, unconditionally, so that they can spend it on the things that they need. They're, to my money, the best charity in the world. Wow. Thank you, David. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.